ever notice that sometimes the thoughts you think aren't very constructive? If not with yourself, maybe you've seen others catastrophize about things that are unlikely to happen. So the thing I want to focus on here is to differentiate between thinking your thoughts and believing your thoughts. Those who can make that distinction tend to have far more successful and peaceful lives than those who don't. For example, say you're getting caught up in negative emotions like worrying or overwhelm, regret, confusion, or even hopelessness. It might be because there are legitimate things you're having to deal with and that's a natural human response. But it could also be that you're believing some thoughts that you're thinking when they aren't really true. In this episode, we'll look at four steps to break free of feeling like you have to believe all your thoughts. And once you do that, you can choose which thoughts you want, which will lead to other kinds of emotions and actions, and that will help manifest the life and the world you truly desire. This golden age, I think, is possible in part through changing how we think. Hi, I'm Carly Rieger, and you're listening to the Golden Age Timeline Podcast. As I mentioned in the last episode, many people have actual addictions to certain negative emotions and will conjure up thoughts subconsciously that create those emotions. And I'll go so far as to say we actually create situations, albeit subconsciously in many cases, to generate that particular emotion because we're addicted to the neurochemicals they create in our bodies. Here's a simple example some people might relate to. I used to always be late for things that were important to be on time for. And that way I'd be sure to fill my body with adrenaline as I raced to get there. I thought I was just disorganized, but it was actually the adrenaline addiction. I wasn't disorganized in other areas of life. I wasn't inconsiderate in other areas of life, which is how others viewed me who were left waiting for me to arrive. At least not that often. And when I examined both the thoughts and that addiction to adrenaline, I could make new choices. I realized I could apply my organizational skills to getting ready on time. Like putting things by the door that I'd need instead of waiting for the exact moment I'd have to leave to be on time to start getting my bag together and deciding to leave 20 minutes early in case there were delays on the way, which there usually were. And I thought of other areas of life where I was considerate of other people's needs and time. So I could do that with lunch meetings with colleagues and friends and not leave them waiting 20 minutes. At first it was uncomfortable driving at the speed limit, not rushing, just being cool, calm, centered. Part of me wanted more drama. I craved the adrenaline. But when I weighed the pros and cons of the health issues that arose for me due to all the stress, it motivated me to change my thoughts, which led to being peaceful more often, which led to better health, better relationships with others and with myself. So these small interchanges we make can have a big positive domino effect. Of course, you could argue that time is just an illusion or it's relative or time is what keeps people in a 3D consciousness. That in higher density levels of consciousness, time doesn't exist. Or you could say this example is really about a clash between monochronic and polychronic cultures. You know, where monochronic cultures encourage showing respect for other people's schedules and where there's deadlines and is mainly task oriented. Whereas polychronic culture is more holistic, flexible. It's more about the quality of the interaction than the adherence to time, where it's more about the context. And those two ways of being are what you might call group mind stories or egregores. Now, I grew up in a monochronic culture and had many friends who grew up in polychronic cultures. And so being on time for meetings 
or not had different consequences depending on who I was meeting with. My British colleague expected me to be on time and my Mexican colleague was often as late as I was and it was all okay. So those are places to look for thoughts you believe are true when they are simply part of a greater mind story you grew up in. So I hope that makes sense. There are literally dozens, if not hundreds, of these kinds of habits in our lives that could change. So if you're not sure where to start with that, try the four steps I describe here. And for a deeper process, check out our Mind Story Inner Coach book that teaches the five-step Avara model, a fill-in-the-blanks process for discovering what kinds of thoughts you are believing that are entrapping you in some way or disempowering you, and instead giving you a roadmap for getting out of it. See the link in the show notes or go to goldenagetimeline.com backslash shop. Now let's differentiate here between physical sensations, also sometimes called feelings, and emotions, which are neurochemical reactions, also sometimes called feelings. Both are vibrations in the body, but in a different way. So being hungry or sick or hot or cold is a physical feeling. That's a sensation that is involuntary and it starts somewhere in our body and then goes up to the mind for interpretation. But an emotional feeling that I'm talking about here starts with a thought, an interpretation, a belief, and ends up being felt in various parts of the body. Now, some researchers now say that there are brain cells in our gut, in our heart, in our hands, and not just in our brains. But wherever they originate, emotions are created by our interpretations of life, which create a sensation in our body and a neurochemical soup. Now, the reason that your emotions are so important is that they drive your actions, which create certain circumstances in your life for good or for bad. They're basically why we do or don't do every single thing in our life. It's because of how we think it will make us feel or not feel. Humans, of course, have a variety of emotions that are negative and positive and everything in between. And that's a good thing. It creates contrast and variety, like having a full palette of colors as an artist. You wouldn't just want to paint your picture in gray and black and white. And just as you wouldn't understand what white is without knowing the color black, or you wouldn't know what red is without the contrast of blue, you also wouldn't understand curiosity without knowing indifference, or patience without having experienced impatience. But that said, We are programmed to seek positive emotions and avoid negative emotions. It's part of our survival brain programming. Seek love and avoid hate for the species to survive and thrive. Seek contentment and avoid discontentment. Yet many of us find ourselves looping on negative emotions and fighting with ourselves about it. That's where we need to zoom out and see the big picture and ask that age-old question, What is the purpose of life? Everyone is, of course, entitled to their own opinion on that, but I do find the philosophy you choose on this subject can make a big difference. One answer to that question when I was growing up was to be happy. The purpose of life is to be happy. I grew up thinking I was supposed to be happy all the time, and heck, I wasn't. That meant something was wrong with me. You know how parents say, we just want you to be happy. Or friends or partners or advertisements. And the truth was, sometimes I was happy, but a lot of times I wasn't. It was never a consistent feeling of happiness. And over the years, I came to realize that most people also had that experience, trying to be happy all the time and failing at it. And when you think that way, it means any emotion that isn't like happiness, like a positive, joyful feeling, must be banned. Which, of course, creates a pendulum effect. By banning unhappiness, I built it up in my subconscious, in my body. I suppressed it, and so then it grew and became a sensation that owned me. I disowned it, 
so gave it the power to own me. I remember having that epiphany when I was studying comedy. All the teachers I studied with, who were amazing at bringing happiness and joy to others, seemed to have this cloud of depression, despair. Like the minute they weren't doing their comedy and you watched their face, they looked so unhappy. So another response to the question, what is the purpose of life, could be to be human. When I changed to that, everything changed for the better. So it's where the goal in life isn't to be happy all the time. The goal in life is to have the human experience. And with that comes a wide palette of emotions. That gave me the permission to bring a variety of emotions to the forefront rather than suppress them in some way. And people suppress emotions in a variety of ways. I've done them all. The first one, we fight with them. We have an inner war where one part of the personality is trying to dominate the other, bullying yourself to stop the negative emotions. A second way is an outer war whereby you throw the emotion outside you. You see this in young children and sometimes adults for that matter. It might look like a temper tantrum, slamming a door or over dramatizing things where you kind of freak out about things. The third is to dissociate. It's kind of like projecting it onto someone else without telling them. It's where you might be highly judgmental of someone who is expressing any kind of emotion, but you're not openly projecting it onto them. You hold yourself at arm's length, seeing yourself as above them. It's often an intellectual response to life where you have an aloof indifference to things that would normally cause a human to feel something good or bad, like the death of a pet or winning a big contract you wanted. So it's a kind of numbness where life is rather monotone as opposed to animated. The fourth way is escaping the emotion where you're trying to dull them down and distract yourself so as not to feel the sensations and the neurochemicals. And that's the typical addictive behaviors you see, whether it's overeating, drugs, drinking, porn, shopping, shows, on TV, overworking, overcaffeinating. Now, all of those responses only have short-term benefits and long-term negative consequences. All of them block your desired results in life. So a fifth option, which I believe is the natural healthy human response to life is to accept and digest our feelings. When you don't properly digest your feelings, you tend to get emotional indigestion, which can lead to actual indigestion. Emotions get stuck often in the digestive tract. And that's why so many people who avoid dealing with emotions have digestive issues. At some point, it helps to admit that there's no way around a negative emotion. The best way is to just go through it and learn how to digest it. And in the digestion process, your system sorts the nutrition from the non-nutritive elements of the emotion, and then the emotions become fuel for growth. If you don't digest, then you can become malnourished as a human and become stunted, which leads to stunting in many areas of life. So there are four steps to digest emotions. The first step is to acknowledge them. For example, let's use worry. I came from a family where you weren't allowed to worry or feel afraid. That was looked down on. You must be courageous and bold all the time. And as a result, we were all in a perpetual state of unprocessed fear. So think about the patterns you grew up with. What were the emotions you weren't supposed to feel? And that might be an emotion you're addicted to because it's stuck in your system. It hasn't been allowed to go through the typical alchemical process. So by acknowledging an emotion you were taught not to experience, it's like letting a bad child out of their room after them being grounded for a while. You're allowing this part of you to rejoin the family. You accept this part and give it unconditional understanding and love. Not to run amok with a temper tantrum, but to be curious and open to what this particular emotion has to teach you. What is its gift in your life? 
The second step is to find it in your body. For example, I often feel worry in my solar plexus, like a knot in my stomach. And you can also add other descriptions like size, weight, color, or even a metaphor, or even a character. With me, it feels sort of like that Tasmanian devil character from the Looney Tunes cartoon, only he's stuck in a holding cell in my solar plexus. <laughs> so where is it for you and what is it for you? If you turn it into a character, you can actually start dialoguing with it and it can start to tell you what it has to teach you, what its gift is. Because sometimes maybe you're not paying attention to something that's important to pay attention to, or you're just keeping it locked in a cell and it needs to get out so it can process. So then the third step is to relax into the emotion. So it's like you're saying, it's okay, Jasmanian devil. Here we are right now. Come on out of the cell. Be who you are. <laughs> you know, it's part of the human experience. So you're not fighting with it any longer. You're letting it be. Because what you resist persists. So when you take away the resistance, it paradoxically lowers the intensity of the emotion. The fourth step is to accept it until you can see what's driving it. What are thoughts you are believing that aren't even true and turn them around. Sometimes you have to tame the negative emotions to see what untrue thoughts are driving them. So here's one situation. The Tasmanian devil explained what was causing it to spin like a maniac and worry. It was the thought, what if I go broke? Now, I didn't even realize I was thinking that it was ruminating below the surface. I'd never gone broke before, but sometimes business was up and sometimes it was down. So when it was down, the Tasmanian devil would stir up the dirt because it was believing the thought, what if I go broke? Now, of course, what you focus on grows, so I needed to nip that one in the bud. So I replaced it with business does eventually go up again, historically speaking. What if I do financially well? What if things turn around soon? There's many reasons that could be true. And even I made a list of them. <laughs> so the untrue thought under examination dissolves away. The negative emotions dissipate. I'm more motivated to do something constructive about the situation. And lo and behold, instead of being in freeze mode, I'm generating new business. So on top of that, you can start to see how these thoughts are often not even yours. And by yours, I mean generating from your true self, your creative source-based thinking. Often negative thoughts are implanted from outside. There's many theories where they come from. Other people, you're just picking up on their thoughts, subconsciously or intuitively. Subliminal messaging, AI, bad programs you picked up as a child before you had learned proper discernment. Some even say they come from past lives or alternate lives or from disembodied beings or many other sources. But in the end, it doesn't really matter. All that matters is that you get back sovereignty of your own mind. And there's a way of telling if it's a true thought or a false thought. Does it empower you? Is it constructive? Is it inherently creative? Then it's a true thought. Now you can still have negative thoughts that are empowering, constructive, and creative, like saying no to something that's bad for you. But if the thought seems disempowering, destructive, or uncreative, I would say that's a false thought, not yours in general. There are exceptions. But if you discover a thought is false, consider it like malware on your laptop and delete it. Your intention and imagination alone are very powerful in doing this. Of course, there's many techniques taught on how to delete them, but in the end, it's all the power of your intention that does it. So have a firm intention. That said, we do have the Mind Story Blueprint program that helps you override 15 of the most common false beliefs people have. 
and the audio course guides you through the process of unchoosing those and instead choosing the empowering, constructive, and creative thoughts to help you thrive. Just look for the link in the show notes or go to goldenagetimeline.com shop tab. At the core of all this is to understand how a mind story works, also known as an egregore or as an interweaving pattern of beliefs all rolled up into an operating system that you use to interpret your life. Some are empowering and some are disempowering. The idea is to take back control of your own system of thinking. There are thousands of individual mind stories that we have, but there's the group or culture mind stories that I talked about. There's also a large overall mind story of humanity. There's a theory that we as a collective have a mind story operating system we run on for a certain period of time, and then it's time for an upgrade. It's like moving from Mojave OS to Big Sur OS on your Mac. And some say that now is a time in history for that upgrade. One theory is that we've been living in 1,000 years of strife, and now we're moving into a thousand years of peace. The idea behind the golden age timeline. To get there, however, is not an external thing, or it doesn't start there. It starts on the inside by upgrading your personal mind story, which then helps upgrade the collective mind story, and then the external changes for the better. This is a theme in the novel Heliotropus. If you like epic fantasy novels, available also on the shop tab at goldenagetimeline.com. So to get there requires forging ourselves in the fire of wisdom. So it's the natural alchemical process we as humans are meant to go through. And so it breaks us free from a pattern of stuckness whereby our system relies on the neurochemicals of negative emotions to function. We now rely on the neurochemical balance of positive emotions in our bodies, which help us evolve rather than devolve. So it creates a wholesome system whereby we use fear as fuel or anger as fuel or grief or defeat or whatever is the negative emotion. And it's needed as the raw material that gets transformed in the combustion process into the next creative reinvention in your life, big or small. So this perspective alone can help you accept, digest, and transform negative emotions into fuel for growth, knowing that you stunt your growth if you don't, knowing that it's often the storm before the calm. In fact, you can start to trace this and notice it in your life because periods of great creative insights, new ideas, new growth are almost always preceded by darkness of negative emotions, of challenge and hardship. It's like you can't have one without the other. So the next time you're going through a hard time, which might be now, expect that you will soon be coming up the roller coaster ride again and experiencing an upswing in your life. It's the necessary first step to positive growth. So the less you resist it, the more you just go with it, the quicker you get there. Like I said, these steps are based on the beginning of the five step Avara model featured in our book, Mind Story Inner Coach. And it's a process that's been honed on over 9,000 coaching clients over 23 years through the Mind Story Coaching Academy. The Avara model can help you break free of anything, anytime, anywhere very quickly. So for a limited time, we're offering this book for only $7 on our website, goldenagetimeline.com backslash shop. You can get it via card, PayPal, or crypto. Along with the book, you also get two free short guided audios that are called neuro blueprints. They are a form of mental rehearsal that opens up communication between your conscious and subconscious mind to deepen your ability to transform thoughts and digest emotions. One is called how to end self sabotage. If there's any area of your life where you feel you're doing that and it's one you would use at night. And the other is called Your Hero's Journey, which is about reframing the challenges of your life in terms of a mythic adventure and how those challenges have forged you in the fire of wisdom to now help others. Sometimes that's hard to see until you do a process like this. And this is a version you would listen to in the morning. These take chapters two and 10 of the book to a much deeper level. 
Altogether, the audios in the book come to $94 US normally, but you can get them now for only $7. So that's it for today. Do like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already done so, as that helps others find the material. So I hope that was helpful. Until next time, thanks for listening.